Today on the Ask a Cycling Coach podcast, we're going to cover some hot takes on lots of topics, including intermittent fasting, inflammation, off seasons, and more. So let's get into it. Hi, guys. First Hello. hot take. First hot take. Let's do it. Freshness is better than fitness. Chad, what do you think? Uh, this kind of implies that you can have one without the other. And so let's be clear, you can't because freshness doesn't matter if you're not unmasking a uh, wealth of fitness and uh, fitness doesn't matter if it doesn't, if you don't have fitness, it doesn't matter how fresh you are. You're not going to be able to do anything. So uh, trying to rank one of these over the other kind of breaks my brain. It's really hard for it's, me to say that one is more important than the other. It's obviously fitness. I am the freshest I've ever been in my life. Yeah. I was like, just going to say, I haven't been Nate, you're, a year. Nate, you're crazy fresh. <laughs> yeah. Where I, the true. worst I've, the worst I've been uh, in like a whole, I was still probably 150 watt FTP watts higher. Of course, chronic fatigue syndrome or something like that. But, f- but being, this is a bit good point being slightly tired, uh, slightly less fresh, but being fitter going mm-hmm. into a race is perfectly fine. Cause I think a lot of people get mm-hmm. scared that, Hey, I'm not fresh enough coming to this. I'm not gonna be able to perform because they've been putting so much work in for a long time. Um, of course the best is if you can balance both. And sometimes we've seen that with athletes who get injured or have something work come up and you actually can't train for two weeks and you come out with the, <laughs> you're the fastest you've ever been. Um, <laughs> but I mean, f- fitness, fitness is the cake and freshness is the icing. Uh, right. freshness is like the sharpness of the blade. I guess that's not a good way to put it, but yeah, I'm yeah. going to say cake and icing. Yeah. I think people <laughs> I like misattribute, um, like training fatigue or overtraining, um, a lot. Uh, I don't think I've known more than like four or five athletes that have actually overtrained and need mm. more freshness. I don't know. What do you think, John? Yeah. It, first of all, it's nice to, uh, I'm, I'm not the host today. It's pretty great. Yeah, are you, is it, awesome are you okay? Host. Is it, how do you I, feel? <laughs> I'll be fine. I'm going to talk less, I think. Uh, uh, so I think that the way too many athletes concern themselves or they concern themselves too much with freshness. I see it all the time where they're like, I just, and Chad, you're nodding your head too. You've seen it way more Mm -hmm. than I have, but like, I I think that, and I've real, I'd love to see some sort of study done where it takes an athlete's like perception of what they're expecting and then looks Mm -hmm. at like their training stress coming in and looks at like six week versus current, that sort of thing. And then sees what the actual outcome is in the race, because there are times and I'm like, oh, I'm so fatigued. So I've already put myself in a hole for the race. Who cares how fresh I actually am? Like. Freshness is tricky, and I think that a lot of athletes just make mistakes because they overfocus on it when really fitness is key. And two, we're taking talking about this in the context of a race, like mm-hmm. day to day training. Yeah, exactly. Day to day training. Of course, you have to be considered about not going. You know, training eight days in a row, then taking two weeks off because you've put yourself in such a hole. This is, you know, peaking for that a race. Is it better to have some fitness or to be super fresh? Well, and also emphasizing freshness anytime outside of what you just said, Nate, peak performances and races is kind of that. I think that's where everyone gets a little bit off track. I need to be fresh for what? Just about everything. So if you're always concerning yourself with being fresh for the next workout, never really running yourself down, never putting yourself in that necessary hole, then your, your fitness simply is going to stagnate. You have to at points not be fresh. It's required. (laughs) Yeah. Google super compensation and Maxine, can you put this image up? This shows you where you have to get fatigued and then that damage to your body. The rest after that is what makes you more fit. And there's a limit to how fatigued you can get where it's, um, productive, right, Chad. Mm -hmm. And then, um, but you have to, you, you have to get in that hole. And sometimes if you can get if you've plateaued for a long time, sometimes that hole isn't being dug deep enough every time. But oftentimes, yeah, too, at, people will jump in too high and go too deep, too. It's, it's very hard to balance this. Yeah, it's a perfect way to put it, too. And if you look at what that is, if you just look at a horizontal line and you look at the, the line that Nate's describing, when you dip below that line, that's the hole we're talking about. And how deep you dig that hole, how wide that hole is, the depth and the width, those are the things that matter. Those are the things that are going to determine whether or not you can bounce back from the training stress you just inflicted, whether it's going to derail further training, whether it's going to yield freshness, et cetera. Look at the best performers in life, not just on bikes, but inclusive of bikes. They perform in less than ideal circumstances and they find a way to do it. Mm-hmm. I think that's like, uh, that's a, that's a big thing. Uh, Ivy like cyclocross season's super long, right? Like I'm sure that you see athletes that, and you yourself if on days where you're not your best, you still find a way to, to at least let your fitness show, you know, the only 
NRC crit I ever won was on a borrowed bike from a completely different team because mine was lost in transit. Wow. Like, you just go. gotta, <laughs> yeah. I want to um, continue optimal. on what Chad said about that hole, the depth and the width. Now, how fast you're going to come out of that hole is going to be a combination of nutrition, sleep, and stress. I, I, I have, uh, carbs and protein and also sleep. I mean, how many of us, you probably all felt it. You get nine hours sleep versus seven hours sleep, three days in a row, mm. then nine, three mm. days in a row. I almost feel like my, like my legs get bigger when I get out of bed. Um, <laughs> the whole day is better. I can concentrate a few days of sevens and it's, 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 it's rough on me. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. I think that's yeah. what I'm kind of, what I was trying to allude to when I mentioned people misattributing, uh, their training load and thinking that they need to be fresh and they're doing too much and trying to think about getting ready for their event or a key workout or something. And they're not, it's not training load. It's not training fatigue. It's all that other stuff that you just mentioned, stress and mm -hmm. nutrition and sleep. I have a hot take. We're gonna do this live. Uh, when would you, <laughs> when would you sacrifice sleep for training? Cause I think we all have. <laughs> I was just about to say, I would never do that. And then I was like, you yeah. have. <laughs> yeah. With some, someone from the perspective of not having kids, the only time I wouldn't be concerned with the quality of my sleep would be the night before an event. Yeah. I think I, like the very night, the, the night before that is the, far more key. So yeah. And I'm not saying I would sacrifice sleep in that case. That's the only time I wouldn't be concerned with it. I can't think of instances where I, again, without having children would intentionally sacrifice sleep. <laughs> yeah. Uh, there's there's, I, I there's have no point it, in throwing right. water into the sponge if it can't absorb, right? Like, yeah. and that's, and you need sleep to be able to, and this is really hard because I'm trying to think of a lot of people listening to this right now and somebody's working night shift and they've got kids and they've got a crazy, really, really busy, high demand life. And they're like, well, cool. Then I shouldn't even train. And I don't want to communicate that because that like you, you, in, in certain circumstances, there are going to be athletes that are going to be training through sleep deprivation in one way or another. But yeah. I feel like you have to be realistic and make adjustments to that. You know, well, you, you do what you can. And of course there's life stuff on it and we're all going to be constrained about some parts of our life, but I'm talking about, I have sacrificed sleep for that early morning group ride where mm -hmm. it is something where I'm like, I wouldn't actually probably do this mm -hmm. by myself because it's going to be a six hour ride. I've done it with you guys, a six hour gravel ride or something. But I have to get up at 630, which I don't normally do on the weekend. And hmm. I would do that sporadically. If I tune in the next Sunday, I could sleep in a little bit more. But I wouldn't that's be true. doing that every day. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a balance about that's a balance between the added sleep and what you're going to get out of the, the training. So uh, that makes perfect sense to me. Yeah. And I've done it a million times. Just don't make it chronic. Right. Where <laughs> yeah. it, every yeah, single day is that uh, or if you know that every single night you only get six and a half, seven hours. No, that's going to reduce your total volume. Yeah. Because you're not going to, you're not going to come out of that hole as fast. That's all yeah, you got. You just can't, you can't, you can't put as much in there. Like it's like the jar and filling it that same old thing that you see filling it with stand, sand and stones and all that stuff. It's finite. Like you can't just pack it in and then hope that somehow it's all going to work out. You're just going to train less, but you know what? You might actually, Oh, I'm, I'm quite confident in saying that a person, if they're not able to sleep as much, if you train less, you're going to be faster than if you were trying to train more and still had your sleep limited as is that, cause that's just going to get you tired, not allow you to be consistent, probably increase things like, you know, uh, tendency for illness, all that stuff. So yeah, yeah, but training less, you can get fast with less. Yeah. Good ad lib hot take, Nate. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> all right. TT bikes shouldn't be allowed in stage races for amateur categories. I they are? love this. Oh, they, they shouldn't they be are? allowed. They shouldn't oh, be allowed. Yeah, they shouldn't. Yeah, and this I is only on this TT hunting. stages, right? Not like a, not like a, <laughs> <laughs> the Peloton maze. Because I agree with that. Yeah, I'm sorry for, for that TT really loud stages. lawnmower <laughs> behind. If anybody hears this, I mm -hmm. forgot on uh, when we're recording this, we've got loud stuff. So sorry. Do you hear that? Uh, I agree with this hot take. I don't think, I, I love when stage races have Merck's time trials where you have to use the same mass start legal bike for all of the stages. I feel like there are way more competitors from like other regions in, in the States because it's easier to carpool and travel when you only have one bike per person. And the beginner categories are huge too. Like people are, there's less of a barrier of entry when you don't have to have a TT bike to be competitive. Mm -hmm. 
What do you yeah, guys I think? think this is a wonderful equalizer, especially across the lower categories. And it, it kind of, it makes it fun because it's a, it's a true race of attrition and power and suffering and all the things it should be and doesn't lean so hard on the technological side and emphasize the marginal gains. Rather, it says you're either strong or you're not. So I, I, I love this idea. I never really considered it, but I'm always fascinated when the TT is a Merck style TT. That's always just more interesting to me because again, it just levels the field. Mm-hmm. P12 TT bikes, three, four, five Mercs. If it's a two by itself, still Mercs. Only if it's looped, looped in with the P12. That should be the rule. More inclusive, yeah. uh, way easier for people to actually show up to these stage races who might say, I don't want to do it because I'm not going to be competitive. Well, on top of it, it, it kind of takes my head out of the game a little bit when I look at the the rivals whom with which I'm competing, and they don't have the fancy gear. I mean, if one of them is on a regular time trial bike, it's a little bit heartbreaking to think they don't stand a chance. They could actually be a fitter, faster rider than me, and I'm probably still going to smoke them simply because I do have that <laughs> massive technological Look at advantage. Chad. Chad just looks at his competition and he pities them for the damage he's about to do. I just think Oscar De La Hoya used to do that. He would not yeah. look in people's eyes because he knew he didn't want to have pity for them. So, Chad, don't look at anyone's mm-hmm. eyes who have a, mer- a, a regular Dude, bike. That is, that is brutal. I didn't want to have pity for him. That's intense. I, Chad, I'm thinking of Chad driving down to like Valley of, the, Valley of Fire stage race down in like Las Vegas and stuff back in the day. Mm. I bet he brought his TT bike and I bet he smoked him on it. So We did. All know. three of us did and we smoked yeah. everybody. And yeah. there were a lot of people who weren't on TT bikes. It's, yeah, it's, it's a sad yeah. truth. It's I cool have nothing to, to add that hasn't been added other than, yeah, it's a pain to travel with a lot of bikes. In a lot of cases, races mm. like this have people traveling. I would love to see this rule put in place. Yeah. Instead of and worrying from, about s- silly things like sock height. Like, come on, you know? Yeah. So. It's cool from a, a overall race perspective, too, when the margins are so much. <laughs> are you thinking about sock height, Nate? <laughs> yeah, because the next question, sock height, and now John, that he loves triathlon. <laughs> He's very concerned about <laughs> having a cool. This is a good segue. Yeah. I was just going to say that the margins in stage races when they're Merck style TTs are, I feel like they're a little bit closer and it makes the racing more exciting later when people are racing for, you know, when four or five racers are racing for the same time bonus and all in contention versus, you know, I feel like the time gaps are so much bigger with TT bikes because mm-hmm. they're rolling. Well, we Anyways. could put it in terms of, of, of Dan Bigham versus Philip Ogana. I mean, the, 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 the difference in power relative to the difference in CDA is ridiculous. Yeah. We can get to that. I know we have a question later, so I'll save it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> is John a better person now that he loves triathlon? <laughs> <laughs> a better person. He's more inclusive. It's broad. Has it's it some, humbled you? Like You can wear different sock heights or no sock. No socks. <laughs> no, I, I think oh, I, oh. I should be clear that no, no, I, I, I still am quite strict on mid calf. Um, <laughs> I was just commenting on the fact that like the UCI has all these rules about like your socks can't be above. I think it's above mid calf. It's halfway mm-hmm. between the ankle and the knee. Is that right? I thought about getting uh, a tattoo, know. like a, just a little line tattoo right where it was. <laughs> yeah. Wouldn't that be cool though? Like just a teeny that's, one. You couldn't see it. it. Yeah. Uh, I think it's a really cool idea. I might still do it. That's a pretty good idea. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm I not a tattoo that. guy, but I would, I would actually consider that one. You just do a little yeah, like two millimeter one. Yeah, no, you would even even know, and you'd be like, <laughs> "Hey, tattoo. official, it's right here." Get, so you could actually like, do TT, and the top of the T's is the line. <laughs> Imagine somebody coming up to you and asking you, like, "What does that tattoo mean?" Like, expect like some deep thing, and then you're like, "You see, I rule number XXX." <laughs> like, uh, imagine if they change it, so you would like have to say like the year. Just put an X on it. Just put an X through it, and then, then change it. 2023, yeah. 2024. <laughs> and I, I got to ask on a, on a personal level. You say John loves triathlon. Just how deep is your affinity all of a sudden for for something that you used to? <laughs> I don't know. Views were different. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Chad. Thanks for censoring for me. That was great. Um, I f- honestly, I I I enjoy triathlon. I like it. It's a really fun challenge to take on. Um, I've always admired triathletes a lot too. Just I, it's a it's mm-hmm. a lot to do, but it's not to the point where like, eh, I'll do cycling events, you know, when I can. Triathlon's my thing. It's definitely not that case. I just like doing a lot of stuff. I've really focused on just bikes for a really long time, and. I've done that and I haven't won national championships. Uh, I think stars would have to align for me to win a national championship, you know? Um, and I've chased that pretty hard for quite a few years and a lot of sacrifice comes with it. If I can still, I I still feel like I can race and have fun and be competitive. 
maybe not win a national championship, but maybe that can't happen anyway, but still do multi-sport stuff. I think the biggest thing that I love about it is the fact that I feel way healthier as a person running and swimming and doing all those other things. I'm just like, I'm not like a, a weird, like circular scape, shaped scalpel that a surgeon only uses one time in their career. That's kind of what I felt like. Like if I had to do anything other than that, I wasn't useful. So yeah, I don't know. I don't know if it makes me a better person though. I have no clue. Uh, I, I think, know. I think it's a sign of maturity. You're just branching out, trying to be good at a lot of things instead of really good at one thing. Yeah, yeah cuz as good as I tried I still wasn't good enough. So <laughs> I'm just happy to see you be human and like be bad at something. So yeah. uh, <laughs> Thanks, Abby. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you bet. Glad you got I could it. Help. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Glad I could help. Oh man. <clears throat> okay, hot take. Cyclocross racing is more technical than XCO. I super Heck. agree with this. Heck no. No oh, way. I I completely agree with this. 100%. No, Nate, 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 tell me about your cyclocross experience. <laughs> cyclocross racing is all, while technical, XCO is so much more technical uh, than cyclocross and the, 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 um, what, not the results, but the, what's it called when you get hurt? The consequences Crashes. of your actions. Oh, consequences. <laughs> <laughs> your consequences are so much high in XCO, which adds an extra layer of, of mm -hmm. technicality. Of course, it, it, so think of like a World Cup. XCO race, those things are technical in my mind. Um, more than an XCO. I could do an XCO course. How about this? I could survive an XCO course at a World Cup cyclocross course for sure. 100%. I could not do it on X or sorry. I, could, <laughs> I can't talk today. Um, I could survive in cyclocross <laughs> at World Cup, but I could not survive an XCO. I would, I would crash. I would hurt myself. I'd break bones. I'd have to walk things. I mean, cyclocross, I'd walk things too, but because it's just muddy. Um, yeah. For sure. Well, I think that's kind of the distinction or the reason why I disagree. I think that at the highest level for, for someone that is like a beginner in cycle cross and you're just looking at these features and kind of riding them at a safe, comfortable speed or just running them when you're not comfortable riding it. That's a totally different experience than at the top level where you're like riding at super high speeds in these ruts. Um, you know, being super under biked on some pretty technically demanding features at speed. And I feel like the moments of testing your equipment and finding the limits for each of these corners are so much more frequent than in an XCO where the, I feel like there are big moments that are big high consequence and they're more few and far between than in cyclocross where you just have like moment after moment after moment of really technically demanding uh, sections. That's what I, I think. I can still ride mud. I was in South Africa and I saw the corkscrew <laughs> for that like course thing. Have you guys seen the corkscrew? It does not do justice on TV. You sit up there. It's just like a mine shaft going straight down. You have to ride the walls back and forth <laughs> with like this bump coming in. It is terrifying. I could, I couldn't slide down on my butt on it. Like seriously, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, just not the same of riding. I've, I've ridden muddy, uh, ruts a lot. It's actually super fun. And you just kind of like surf. Um, I'm not the fastest at it, of course, but I just technically can't even ride XCO courses where I could ride all the cyclocross courses. Yeah, I, I, I disagree. And I, for two reasons, number one, the bike, I think is one of the biggest things. Uh -huh. Your bike is such a limiter in cyclocross. So navigating a turn on a mountain bike is darn easy. Navigating a turn on a cyclocross bike is a lot harder because you have on a mountain bike, you have a big contact patch, you have bigger knobs, you have suspension, you have more relaxed geometry, you have flat bars instead of narrow drop bars. You have all these things set up to make your bike more capable to ride over terrain. Whereas on a cyclocross bike, you don't notice it, uh, or it's, it's way tougher. I almost, I have like a poorly thought through like a metaphor. Let's hear for this. it then. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. Lay it on us. I, uh, so like, uh, I can play guitar to the extent that I can like see chords and I can play chords, but I can't like if, when I'm listening to somebody that's like improvising and they're like playing jazz and it's something like that, that's a tie entirely different level. And I feel like when I watch a really good cyclocross racer and when they're going around the course, like uh, Celine Del Carmen Alvarado, and when she's going around a course, she makes it look so darn easy that I don't realize how complicated it actually is what she's doing. And the one thing about mountain bikes is it's almost like playing guitar hero instead of a real guitar, because it's like, 
in the sense <laughs> that it's like it's like bowling with bumpers because your equipment's designed to help you through a lot of that stuff. So I think that's why we've seen Matthew Vanderpool come to cross country racing and just not be phased by a single thing. Cause he's like, Hey, I'm doing this on a bike that has bad geo. And I'm not saying bad geo, uh, like the Canyon, it's just cyclocross bikes, right? Like yeah. it's been limiting. It's been difficult. And honestly, how often are cross country courses putting you into circumstances where your bike is fully being like stretched to its limits? If you watch world cup cross country, that's one thing. And it might happen two times per lap, one time per lap, maybe three, but for us, average cross country racers and the courses we're doing, it never happens. It's not even close. We don't do the stuff that you see in world cups. And whereas at a local cross or local cyclocross race, you might come across a super steep off camber section where your bike is really being pushed to its limits. So I think it's actually more technical. Um, but it's interesting to hear Nate's perspective because Nate and I view technicality, risk, fear, all that stuff on bikes, like from a totally different lens. It could Mm -hmm. be speed too. Like I, everything in my life is better with speed and on, and for Nate, it's the opposite. And for mountain biking, when there's more speed, everything is easier for me. Whereas in cyclocross, less speed, it's more difficult. I represent the majority of humans who have these bikes, John, <laughs> you're like, I was, a na- I didn't win national championship, but I people. still was the fastest on the descents. And he's like, it's no problem. I don't know why you guys have any problems with this. It's so easy. <laughs> uh, what do you yeah. think, Chad? I'm curious on Chad's uh, thoughts. So, so I have two points. First off, Jonathan, you need to move on to scales because you're never going to be able to improvise if all you know are chords. So work on your scales. <laughs> and it's, it'll, be a, it'll be a full game changer for you. It's just Thanks, scales Chad. they play. They just play best around the scales. But you, if, if you haven't gotten to scales yet, you're doing yourself a tremendous disservice. Uh, okay, and then secondly, I think the technicality of the discipline, in this case, cyclocross versus XCO, has to be related to not just the course, but also the bike you're riding. So Jonathan kind of took my answer. Um, it, you can't say a cyclocross course is more technical than an XCO course without considering how adept the equipment you'll be riding actually is. To do the most untechnical XCO course on a cross bike would be tremendously difficult. The most technical cyclocross course on a full suspension mountain bike would be a breeze. So yeah. I think because cyclocross is performed on technical to very technical courses on equipment that isn't really built around navigating those courses super well, it, it, it just, you have to relate those two. And, and it, it makes me lean toward thinking cyclocross is the more technical sport. I feel validated. Thank you. Y'all are, y'all are wrong. <laughs> this, this is one. why <laughs> dropper posts would be super helpful in cross country or in cyclocross. In every cycle. I have one, but really. Yeah. And it's <laughs> yeah. because your bike is more limiting and like one of the main limiting factors of a cyclocross bike is where your saddle is when you're going down steep little stuff and it's your turns. Mm-hmm. That's why it'll happen. It's just, you know, like give it a, probably two years and we're going to start to see more and more bikes with droppers in cyclocross, I think. Yeah. Here for it. All right. High carb intake has taken priority over power to weight ratio in the pro Peloton. I I'm taking a lot of these first, but I have issue with the context of this, of that, the, what they're trying to say is that high carb intake will make you gain weight, which is not true. It's if oh, you I'm have not a, reading it that way. Yeah. Well, huh. it, well, taking priority over power to weight ratio, which makes me think that they think that if you lower your carb intake, you increase your power to weight ratio, where in fact, if you increase your carb intake, you will probably increase your power to weight ratio because you have more power and you can still consume the same amount of calories every day and not gain weight. I was thinking of it from like the measuring stick perspective that like people measure themselves by power to weight ratio. And now they're measuring themselves by how many carbs they oh, can take in. I got you. Know? you. Um, but you, yeah, you bring up a really good point with that. Everyone's still afraid to take in more. And when they heard Mateo Jorgensen on our podcast, say he took in 160 grams an hour. Mm-hmm. Like I bet people are like, Oh my gosh, he's going to be fat. And I Dr. Po- <laughs> Dr. Poljegar was telling us what 160, 180. Some people on board are doing yeah. per hour. Uh, yes. it's, so not everyone pro teams, there's like a pro Peloton. People are seeing that now and getting great performance. We've been saying it for a while, uh, <laughs> but not, not everyone has come to this, but I think the way to get to a high power to weight ratio is through high carb intake, uh, during your ride, better recovery. You come out of that little like Valley faster and throughout your day. And this is what we know about pro Pel- The best in the world are now doing this. Yeah. What do you think, Chad? Mm. 
Uh, well, without getting pedantic or getting lost in how this question could be interpreted, I think it's interesting that there has been a shift and, and now we're allowing riders to more sufficiently. And rather than high carbon take, let's just call it sufficient carbon take. Let's, let's talk about actually fueling yeah. the work that is required of the athletes rather than overdoing it and, you know, affecting body composition and therefore power to weight. So getting the intake right has shown, has demonstrated across the board, the athletes, endurance athletes, especially just perform better. You can't, it's undeniable and they can go to ridiculous high intakes and seldom if ever gain weight. And it's, it's kind of recognizable too. I've, I've watched over maybe just this season of grand tours. I've seen less lean riders and they're still extremely lean, but typically you would see, I mean, they'd send uh, Instagram posts of uh, the, just the, the, mm-hmm. the veins sticking out on some cyclist's lower leg. But even just watching them ride their bikes and seeing their arms, which typically had used to have just tons of definition um, in the sweat and the light and all that definitely affected it. But you could see they were like paper skin lean. And that's not as common now. I notice so much of it now. And I think it's two things. First, they're hydrating better and they're retaining more salt. And therefore, they're going to be just a little bit puffier. But also – they're more nourished. And that extra little bit of fat, though, uh, though perceptible to us, perceptible to them, is so performance beneficial. And mm-hmm. keep in mind what Chad's talking about is like, I mean, they genuinely looked unhealthy. That was the mm-hmm. look oh, of man. a cyclist. Chad's not talking about wherever you are, listener, going from your position to then gaining a little bit of fat. No, like if you feel your work and you do your workouts, it's not going to increase your body fat. Like this is just looking at people that truly look malnourished and then now they look nourished and big shock, their performance is better. So yeah. Yeah. Well, it's a beautiful thing to see. We love it. Good segue. The next one though, intermittent fasting is an eating disorder. Mm -hmm. I agree with this hot take, but (laughs) interesting to hear what you guys say. I think it has the potential to be a form of disordered eating. If, if people do it wrong and they undernourish, uh, skipping breakfast uh, can can work for a number of people. We, we talked about the benefits and how well they translate to endurance performance, and it's not it's definitely not straightforward. And I don't think it's recommended. I wouldn't recommend it for most athletes, but uh, I think it can be done in a way that is uh, moderate and acceptable, and probably doesn't come at the detriment of performance or good health. Mm-hmm. I think I, I I was listening to. Uh, some uh, researchers, uh, we've uh, uh, Chad, Nate, and I uh, talk about them quite a lot. But um, I was listening to them talk about this and how, in most cases, I think there was a study done where they were looking at actual calorie intake with intermittent fasting, and like intermittent fasting just put people in a calorie deficit, and like, uh, and that's why they lost weight. It makes I it think easy. That there's, yeah, and and like mm-hmm. I, I think there's just because it's harder to fit all that food in into a compressed timeline or less meals, less opportunity. Right. And, uh, so I think that there's a lot of misattribution there where people think that there's some sort of magic there when it's just like, you're eating less than you're burning. Like that's that's how it goes. You know, there are plenty of people who live off two meals a day and even endurance athletes who live off two meals a day and they don't have to label it intermittent fasting and it's still healthful and ergogenic. So it, it just because you only eat a couple of meals a day, doesn't relegate you to this or pr- promote you to this description. It, it's, mm-hmm. it doesn't have to be something that it's not. Yeah. It's, it's, um, I'm going to read some definitions or some signs of disordered eating, um, because it's really your thoughts around it rather than exactly if you do intermittent fasting or not. So frequent dieting, anxiety associated with specific foods or meal skipping, chronic weight fluctuations, rigid rituals and routines surrounding food and exercise, feelings of guilt and shame associating with eating. That's a big one. Preoccupation with food, weight, and body image that negatively impacts quality of life, a feeling of loss and control around food, including compulsive eating habits, using exercise, food restriction, fasting, or purging to make up for bad foods consumed and bad foods in air quotes. Um, So depending, I know some people, especially cyclists, they do have a preoccupation with the food and weight and spot power to bot power to weight ratio. Um, if it negatively impacts your quality of life, you could be on the side, the side of it. If it doesn't and you enjoy it and it's not a big deal, um, you might not. But if you hear some of those things, I would um, suggest talking to a therapist um, and, and learning more because uh, yeah. it's very easy to slip into this. 
It is. And I don't think I've known anyone that's done intermittent fasting that hasn't done it for um, like a body composition change or something that isn't uh, sustainable or necessarily healthy, you know. Um, so I think that's why I associate this with disordered eating. I know my perspective is pretty extreme, but I even calorie deficits are like self-harm to me. So I know my, um, <laughs> perception is a little skewed. Yeah. I a hundred percent Ivy support you in that. I I've drift, I've struggled with disordered eating for like my whole life really. Like, uh, and it's a thing where all ebb and flow. And the biggest, I know this sounds silly. I, I'm just sharing this cause hopefully it's helpful to somebody, but the biggest way that I can tell that I'm slipping again and I'm falling back into it is when the rest of my life is suddenly not enjoyable. I know that sounds weird, but it's a small thing. And suddenly like I get less joy from spending time with my family. I get less joy from my hobbies, from riding my bike, from everything else. And if I look back at it, I've probably let some aspect of my life fall into disordered eating once again. So that's at least what, what I look for. And I have to be present about that. And I struggle with it all the time and, and it's okay to struggle with it. I think that like, uh, I'm not saying, uh, encouraging people that have never struggled with it to struggle with it. That's not what I mean by that comment, but instead for those that do struggle with it to know that like, uh, you are in good company in the sense that there's so many people that, that go through this. And so there's nothing wrong with you. This is John's like a triathlete normal. now, so, so he's a good mm-hmm. person. Yeah. Not just <laughs> athletes, <laughs> though, right? <laughs> yeah. Like no, I, yeah, but I think – Go ahead, Chad. In the case of endurance athletes and really any strength to weight emphasis the type of athlete, anyone who em- emphasizes strength to weight, you know, you could be a physique athlete, you could be a wrestler, a fighter, uh, you know, an endurance athlete, of course. Anyone who has to manage that balance for long periods of time – I don't know how you can rise above this. It, it, it has to at some point affect you. It has to at some point kind of claw at you, pull you down a bit until hopefully you recognize it and remedy it. I, every one of those symptoms that Nate list off, listed off that, that list just now, all of those are relatable. I, I've experienced each and every one of those at different points. At some points in time, too many of them all at once. And that's where you, you either get a handle on it or you don't. If, if you're experiencing so many of those symptoms and you're still not just – coming to terms with the fact that this is not healthy. This is not something I can perpetuate healthfully. This is probably at some point not even going to benefit my performance. That's, that's where the issue lies. But if, if you've been in and out of these scenarios and you've recognized the harm that it can do or that it is doing, but you've risen above it, you know, having been exposed to it, I think that describes more of us than, than I think that describes the majority of us. So just because, you experience these things or affected by these things. Don't, don't get down on yourself. Don't necessarily think you have disordered eating or you have an issue or you need to speak to a therapist. That may well be. Do recognize the issue for what it is. Do recognize that you have power. You can control it. You can tweak some of those things and, and, and just loosen the reins a bit and let yourself enjoy life a bit, nourish thoroughly, and, and perform well. Good advice, Chad. Yeah. All right, yeah. next one. Cyclocross pre-rides are overrated. Enjoy the surprise and extra time to get ready. <laughs> and then another one that said hot laps are overrated, which is just like a um, pre-race lap that you do at speed just to kind of see how it rides. Uh, be bold, race cold. <laughs> <laughs> no, this is there's something to this. I know you guys are going to have a different thing that I said, but the not knowing there's this fear that can happen when you're not very technical. That if you do know mm-hmm. and you ride it like before, it's super scary. But then at race, uh-huh. when you're 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 like at race speed and you're o- you're okay and it's really not that dangerous, then you just ride it. Uh, but if you see it ahead of time, you know and you fear it, and then you have problems. That's relatable to me with my son and like a movie. Like we were going to watch Jurassic Park. I did not tell him about all the scary parts beforehand, or else he would not have watched that. So like, <laughs> I had to run him through cold. <laughs> like, <laughs> we got it, man. <laughs> Don't worry, you're okay. <laughs> Ivy, what do you think? Uh, I super disagree. I think you should pre-ride over and over <laughs> and over again <laughs> and overthink absolutely everything. Uh, that's my approach for sure. <laughs> no, really, I, I get, um, there's so much enrichment to pre-riding with other people too. Um, especially at these UCI races when there are UCI only pre-ride times and you get to see the ways in which other really skilled riders are approaching 
these oh. weird technical features. You can learn a lot from other riders that way. Um, I, I think you should pre-ride. What do you think, Chad? I think you're going to get surprised whether you want to or not. I think whether you pre-ride it and you know it backward and forward, it doesn't matter because you're going to take it at different speeds, under different conditions, in congestion. Someone's going to be pushing you faster than you want to go. Someone's going to be towing you faster than you can go. You're going to end up in a situation where you're surprised if you're really racing hard. So whether you pre-ride it or don't, the surprise is coming. And and I do I... think there's a bit of a downside to observing the fast laps as opposed to riding them. Because I remember every time, I don't know how many times I did Nevada City, but a handful at least, every time I went, that bottom turn just spooked me when I was walking to registration or just just surveying the course and just watching earlier races. It just looked terrifying. But then when I'm on the course, taking it at speed and sometimes a little faster than I'd like, it was totally manageable. <laughs> but it got in my head and I had to fight against letting it in my head and just remind myself, you've done this before. You've probably done this particular circuit hundreds of times. You know how to do it. Relax. Yeah. Uh, changing conditions between pre-ride and race time and being mm. surprised. That too. This happened mm. to me really recently <laughs> at Rochester in the UCI race <laughs> where we pre-rode. And then between the last pre-ride time and our race, it had to have rained like half an inch. It was crazy. So was everything that the one that where we, you were sliding down the hill? Yeah. Yes, Everybody needs to go to Ivy's Instagram. I uh, hopefully it's up it's like hilarious. where people can see. That wasn't it. even the craziest part. We there's a really steep, super steep run up section and it was hilarious but also humiliating and awful that we started running up watch. and just you know, a dozen riders just sliding down. Some riders were stuck there for 3 or 4 minutes just unable to run up this. And we all have toe spikes. We're all skilled pro riders and we just could not get up this hill. And I was like grabbing these trees and <laughs> twigs on the side of the course no, no. to get up. Watching <laughs> it live and then watching it in replay, it was legit nightmare material. The, the material where you, <laughs> or this instances where you're in a dream and you can't run from something, you can't move no matter how hard you try. People were living this in front of a broad audience. It was incredible. Traumatizing. <laughs> yeah. you're, when uh, you slid down the, the muddy hill, that looked like fun though. Oh yeah, like well, it was fun. It was like yeah. wee. Yeah. Well, I was, it's funny I was because I saw <laughs> other riders and they did not look like they were having fun. But Ivy no. was just like <laughs> she was in I'm it. Send it. <laughs> it was awesome. It was so yeah, cool. And, uh, well, um, Rochester has this famously steep hill that they just make you do 180 on, um, and then when it's dry, you can ri- you mu- have to muscle it up, but you can ride all the way up and then drop down. But because of this mud, um, we were all stacked together the first time going down, and you couldn't even remount. We just started slipping out and ended up on our butts, and it was so slick and so steep that we accidentally slid down the first time. And it's one of those features that I'm sure that I could have ridden if you know I had time to like slowly do it in a pre-ride. But once we were in the race, I was like, well, I don't know the best way to do this, and I know that sliding down my butt isn't that much lower, so here we go, and I just <laughs> embraced it and <laughs> got on my butt, and it was it was a great slip and slide time. <laughs> I'm a professional bike racer, by the way. Uh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, here we go. Are gravel bikes worth the hype or just a marketing scam? Oh, John, what do you I, think? Uh, I think that this, I think this is where... <clears throat> So cyclocross bikes are like devoid, uh, not not devoid, but mostly devoid of innovation. They're kind of like static. Mm. And I think that gravel bikes are where you're seeing like the innovation come from and making frames that are compliant and all these other things. The only thing is they don't like, um, and the uh, the reason I'm comparing those two is because they're both like really similar in some respects and some people use one for the other. Mm -hmm. But I think they're, I don't know if they're worth the hype entirely, I have no, I've owned gravel bikes and I don't ever, <laughs> for my riding, I don't, I've sold them all. I like, I don't need them. John, have you um, owned a chamois use... Hagar though? <laughs> no, that's no, real. I mean, you're, you're describing really... something that's really accommodating and a geometry that's really comfortable for that specific terrain because I have a lot yeah, of gravel roads true. out here and I could ride, you know, put maybe, maybe my bike would take 33. So put 33s on my road bike and ride it. And it would kind of suck. I had 33s on my cross bike and I rode it and it kind of sucked. If I put anything bigger than, I don't know, 1.8, 2.0 on a mountain bike, it would kind of suck. That's just too much bike for that. And now I have a gravel bike, 42s, 45s, whatever, just the right tire for around here. And the riding is enjoyable. The geometry is favorable. It's comfortable. I mean, everything about it is so specifically suited to something that's not road, but it's not trail. It's somewhere in between. And this bike 
it just just works in that respect and and it's made me truly love riding gravel roads i think yeah. they what we need though so gravel bikes are not a marketing spam, scam they are you feel so much better on a mark on a on a bike because of the head tube angle the front wheels out farther so it's more stable descending you don't really yep. turn at all in a gravel bike and then dropper posts but i think where they're going john i want your opinion on this mm-hmm. we should just jump to this is hardtail mountain bike with drop bars that should be the gravel bike with uh you know and, and try to just make it light but that is so comfortable safe um fast oh, yeah. and then you that yeah just that you change the geometry a little bit maybe but maybe mm-hmm. not um just around probably where the um because the drop bars you're gonna have to change the yeah. reach a little bit but other than that that is the bike that i think so many people would love to have for gravel that would yeah, for a lot right. of people Two weeks in that scenario, would you to, do like a, oh, sorry, like a really short or like small front shock or like a rigid mountain bike? Yeah. So Keegan for two weeks prior to Leadville was experimenting with this on his hardtail, his high ball, uh, and then running drop bars. And that guy ran through a whole lot of stems trying to find the right feel for it. <clears throat> That's the hard part. Like Nate said, you kind of have to tweak the geometry. So it'd feel, cause I bet it feels a bit like a chamois Hagar in some mm-hmm. respects. And Floppy. if you read like reviews on the chamois hagar people are like yeah it's like it's floppy and it's weird like i think the chamois what is hagar that, by the way can you describe that to listeners not, a floppy? definitely not the me best way definitely not me it. but just every other one that doesn't know what that is it's the gravel bike made by evil and they called it the chamois hagar and it's totally a diversion from a lot of stuff like the head tube angle is like 64 degrees or something 66.6 like like, 66.6 because it's <laughs> nice. evil. Right. yeah yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. um uh, so like really slack um and it's like that's like slack. That's as slack as like a lot of trail bikes to enduro bikes, um, right. which is kind of crazy. But the best way to describe that, you know, what's that chart called when it's like uh, lawful good and like everything else? <laughs> yeah. chaotic, 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 evil. chaotic neutral. And yeah. that bike is like chaotic evil on its own. It's entirely <laughs> separate. Like it's just, it's a weird bike, but I put a, a 200 millimeter dropper on it too. Yeah. So Nate's wow. is wild. Yeah. Um, <laughs> But the, and it fits really wide tires and stuff. Um, but anyways, I, th- I think that the hard tail is with like dropper bars or with drop bars is probably a better solution. I don't know what sort of tweaks you'd have to make. You would have to go with like a lower travel fork. I would think, I don't know, but Keegan said that he just fork. couldn't, yeah, he, he said he couldn't get into a spot where he didn't feel like kind of weirdly stretched out and then mm-hmm. too far over the front of the bike, because it was kind of like, if you think about it. If he was on the hoods, it was like having like a 220 millimeter stem or something, mm-hmm. yeah. which it, is just really weird with mountain bike geometry. It needs something like uh, the Epic Brain in the front so that or like the Fox um, electronic shock. So normally it's just fully locked out. But then when you hit something on descents on a gravel bike, which can be terrifying and you go really fast on gravel roads, you just have all this plushness and you remain so much. You'll have so much more traction and on turning too. so easy, John, right on a turn on a gravel road to hit some little bumps and have oh, that yeah. front wheel wash out. That is not fun at all. But on with a shock, it would be less likely is right. Yeah. Yeah. And I uh, Fox rock shocks MRP were the first ones uh, to do this, but they now have like forks for gravel bikes that are reasonably light and they're they're like 80 mils or 70 mils of travel. So it's you know, not a hundred, but it's, it's enough to keep your front end planted when it otherwise wouldn't be. And that's like what the little, scary thing. You know? What sort of travel do you find on those Lauf forks? Oh yeah. I don't know. I, I've ridden a Lauf before. And the thing I didn't like about it is that because suspension, when you squish up and like when the suspension squishes, it has rebound damping to control mm. the D squish, how it extends back to its full position. Mm-hmm. And those didn't have that. And it almost felt like it made the front end more nervous in more common situations. In some cases it helped, but like washboard, for example, it would hit this like weird point of resonance where like my front end was just the front tire was never planted. And, um, if it was choppy coming into a turn, it felt like it gave me more bouncing back than uh, enough bouncing back so that it made the front end less planted, you know? So Hmm. I think damping is really important. You need that on the, on the compression and rebound side. Um, but anyways, yeah, I, I, I don't think gravel bikes are hype. 
Uh, I don't personally have a use for one uh, in terms of the terrain that I ride and the training and riding that I do. If I lived where Chad is, I guarantee you I would prioritize that over a road bike and everything else. So Yeah, and let's be clear too. I mean, th these are gravel roads, rolling gravel roads, and they're pretty straightforward. But there's plenty of farm roads that are super rutted, uh, actual fire, uh, two-lane fire roads that lead down to rivers. I mean, it gets borderline mountain bikey in some spots. And again, this is a bike that has just enough capability to make that still really fun and control. What bike do you have, Chad? The S-Works Diverge. Ooh, that bike isn't, I, I have nice. ridden that one. I'm quite impressed. It's quite yeah, nice. Really impressed. Yeah. Cool. Specialized right, in Dad. sponsor us, surprisingly. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll say a bad thing about the Diverge. It's heavy, man. Like compared hey. to other gravel bikes, holy cow, that bike is. Yeah, I'm not super concerned. It, I got a bunch of stuff. Tucked into mm -hmm. the down tube, I've got 45 millimeter <laughs> tires on it. I mean, I'm not looking to cut yeah. weight. I'm going to put a dropper on it. The rock shocks, no less. So yeah, I'm not looking to stay it's, light. It's lighter than their hardtail or sorry. It's heavier than their hardtail. I think oh, wow. like if you were to like, uh, have it set up with like forties or 45s probably. And then if you had their mountain bike, their S works hardtail one or like a really me, light hardtail of any brand. Yeah. Let me clear out the down tube and just weigh it and, and we'll get some specs on that. But cool. just to, for everybody else. The weight of your bike isn't always the thing you want to optimize. Hmm. Exactly. I think John knows this, but just because yep. it weighs a little more doesn't mean I mean, you might end up more tired, more crashes, slower descents uh, yeah. on a on a bike that's less capable. Mm -hmm. For sure. Well said. All right, dads. Uh, the road to peak dad fitness <laughs> is 30 minute workouts. Respect. <laughs> <laughs> 30 to 45. <laughs> if if the shoe fits if it's like what works for you yeah like don't discredit the fact that you can actually do quite a lot with just consistency of a 30 minute workouts 100 mm -hmm. if you're in peak dad mode where you are two you're getting less sleep uh john's baby is teething right now he, instagram <sighs> said please send help uh yeah. <laughs> do you wake up how many times per night do you wake up john i mean it's, uh we're just starting so, but it, it's from the last time it's like as much as 10 times a night because they're just constantly poor uncomfortable, thing. poor little things. So, but it's, it's brutal. I, like right now, I, I don't know how athletes, how do you have kids and do like a high volume triathlon training plan? Don't. <laughs> like <laughs> You don't have a job or you don't see your family. Yeah. Like you can't, One of those. you can't fit it all in. Right. Yeah, like I'm, I'm sorry. I'm someone probably can. Yeah. Yeah. You know who's true. good at yeah. that is um, Justin Thomas. He would, you know, goes to sleep early, then wakes up at like four in the morning and gets his training done by like 6 a.m. Uh, yeah. The go to sleep early would... part is, is tough when you have kids too sometimes. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, and to de stress. Yeah. Cause you've got to, well, and you've got to be able to take care of the kids and get them down. And then if your partner needs just time, you know, it's, you know, it's mm -hmm. just, it always changes. But they do that, all the runs with the kid too. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. That's, I'm, I'm looking at a low volume tri plan that I'm planning on starting in November. And I'm just like, Whoa, I'm going to need some faith to make this work. Like, yeah. you know, it's, and I'm planning on getting up. Actually, somebody asked me this the other day, like, how do you fit it all in? I don't know. Like, and, and I'll figure it out, but you know, you early morning, the workouts, John lunchtime, short workouts, and you, you do what you can with what you have, you know, like, so yeah. I don't know. True. I imagine the people that make it work with kids and I have volume to just have the right combo of kids sleeps well, uh, lots of family support, like even just like meal support, childcare, like mm -hmm. I'm sure the start a pool that's close, in. right. Mm -hmm. A number of different ways to make that work. I'm super <laughs> fortunate here too, like at trainer road in the sense that, you know, um, I have friends that have jobs where it's like, you need to sit in your chair and you need to be there from this time to this time. Whereas at trainer road, we're like, Hey, we've got a lot of stuff to do. Let's get our work done, you know? Um, but at the same time, if I, if I need to go swim at lunch and it doesn't fit into a 30 minute break, that's okay because I can get my work done still. Like, so I'm, you know, there's, I'm really fortunate to recognize that. I don't want to pitch myself as being somebody that's like up against unique stops. And, uh, we have a four day work week. So having Fridays off helps a lot. Uh, yeah, it we, does. Yeah, I haven't announced that yet, but we started this two months ago. And the idea is that, uh, you can, there's so much wasted time and you get so tired that during the week that that extra day, it's actually better and more productive for everyone to rest, recover and come back. 
Um, and then we also do is Monday, we do a no, uh, like no Slack day and no meeting day. So Slack, we messages if you need to for your work, but less like public channel, um, uh, company wide channel messages and then no meeting. So you can get into flow. So you come back and you can really work hard. The funny thing is though, at this company, when the first time we did it, we have so many athletes that are like three day weekend. That means I can smash myself three days in a row. And they came back Monday, <laughs> just trash. They're like, wow, I did like you know, 500 miles on the weekend. This is crazy. I love this. Uh, we, we talked about that to kind of, to balance it too. And, um, we also don't work four tens, we work for four eights. And then, like yep. you said, John, flexibility inside of that, because it, for knowledge workers, it's not about the time in the chair. It's, it's about how often and Productive how long you can get into flow. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And getting into a flow state and then having the right, you know, organization and know what you're going to be building and doing and communication, stuff like that. Uh, so that's, it, we started first, that and I think more people are going to fri- do it. Yeah. Agreed. The first, my Friday was like, that's an amazing training day. And now I'm like, it's my day with family and to organize the rest of my life. Mm-hmm. And that's been the cool thing that's helped is that then through the rest of the other four days, I can focus and push way harder in work because I've got, you know, I'm, I'm more balanced, but then also my life is just more organized to allow that. You know? Well, it should, it should translate to the athlete perspective too. It, you don't, it doesn't mean add more training. It, it just means your training is going to be of higher quality. So keep everything the same. And I just enjoy this extra day where mm-hmm. you get to do, do something easier, do family things, do real life things, mm-hmm. recover, rest, sleep in yeah. an extra hour or two, yep. uh, mm-hmm. walk in the park, whatever. Have donuts. Yeah, mm-hmm. exactly. Treat yourself. I did a survey and, uh, <laughs> it's weird, but a hundred percent of the company said we should keep the four day work week. Yeah. That's really weird. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was a it's weird the first result. company wide yeah. consensus ever. And we're still, uh, I feel like we're still super productive. Um, actually I feel like we're more motivated. Cause everyone, yeah. I am, I do say this is always in perpetual beta. I will turn this car around on the way to Disneyland and end it. <laughs> right. yeah. Good luck doing that, by the way. That's a hard yeah, thing anyone, to take back. You know, what will happen is everyone will say, you should pay me 20% more. Cause now you're asking yeah. me to work another day. Yeah. Uh, that'll be the, that will, that will, that's what will happen if I say that. Yeah. Hmm. That's how it goes. That's an Please aircraft don't. carrier with a broken rudder. It's just no turning that ship. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Car cannot be turned around. Sorry. <laughs> All right. Uh, twofold hot take. Uh, first, high resistance cycling training, like hills, bigger efforts, et cetera, can take strength training's place. And oh. on the other side of it, got a hot take that said, Big gear work is BS. Yeah. <laughs> Funny. You got both. <laughs> yeah. It's just no one no. <laughs> Okay, first off, had? resistance training and, and endurance training, never the twain shall meet. They're, they're not the same thing. I mean, we're, we're talking about high force demands and high duration demands. They're just two different animals. So when endurance athletes do strength training, it's to improve things that they're not going to be able to improve with low force work, which is all of our endurance work. So they're, they're just two sides of the coin. And then big gear work is, I think, viewed too narrowly. People think they're doing high resistance cycling training and therefore it doesn't have any value. And in that light, in that, uh, from that viewpoint, that's probably true. That's mostly true. But big gear work can be used for uh, really productive things. In the case of a, a highly anaerobic or glycolytic athlete, it can help them shift some of that to the more oxidative side of things. I mean, a, a grand, grand tour or pro or world level riders use this a lot in the off season to train some oxidative capacity into their faster twitch fibers to make them be able to do five or six hours of work before they have to muster that sprint. So it can be very purposeful in the right context. If you just go out and do big gear work just to do big gear work, I question its validity. But if you understand what that big gear work is aimed at, then it can be very productive. Mm-hmm. This is why Chad, uh, like, uh, I was just doing, uh, oh gosh, I can't remember the name of the workout and I'll probably say the wrong one and somebody will call me out for not having it in there. So I'm not going to say the name right now. Uh, but I was doing, uh, in a lot of our sweet spot base plans and the triathlon base plans, everything else you'll come across and even traditional base plan, you'll come across workouts that break up your intervals with this low, or I should say, don't want to say low gear. I want to say this like low RPM sort of training that you end up doing. Uh, and it breaks it up. It's a great way to do it. And yes, like Chad said, it satisfies those goals. I'm a big fan of it in, in its proper place, but I can't stand this whole thing that like, yeah, it's just like strength training. Like, first of all, if you were so strength not. training, imagine going to the gym and doing 60 reps per minute 
and doing these 60 reps per minute and half repping like, and also with assisted, not doing your full body weight. Like you would never go to the gym and do that exercise. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, for maybe five minutes at a time. Yeah. 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 And, and if you do it, what do you get out of it? I mean, that's right. This just yeah. doesn't compute. Right. We're thinking so it's about just a totally things, different deal, you know? Yeah. The things that you actually get out of strength training outside of the bike. Um, and you really can't replicate that just by doing big gear efforts. Um, you totally end up on like an Instagram page though. Like if somebody was, somebody would totally film you like half repping at 60 reps per minute, <laughs> <laughs> like with bands trying to assist you. Like, oh, yeah. Man. Can we yeah. stop but, filming people in gyms? I feel so <laughs> bad when I see that. Like, true. <laughs> they're just doing their best. It's not right, but <laughs> it's just like, just leave them alone. <laughs> yeah, good All call. right. Okay. Ghana has the hour record or sorry, Ghana has put the hour record on the shelf for a few years. Um, so recently oh, broke the hour record on the velodrome, rode 56.792 kilometers or 35.29 miles in one hour. Uh-huh. <laughs> Insane. <laughs> yeah, he has, he has and he hasn't because he's going to he's gonna up that and he's going to do it well inside of the, the next few years. He's probably going to do it soon. I think – his appetite has been whetted. He, he recognizes he can break 57 kilometers and that's the next new goal. And that's not going to be touched by anybody but him. And once he's done that, and even once what he's done right now is going to stand the test of a lot of time. I mean, he Do could you, go to just a velodrome at a higher altitude. and He could, or just have more favorable air pressure. I mean, Wiggins got yeah. screwed by bad air pressure on the day. I mean, Wiggins wouldn't have done what, what Ghana's done, but yeah, it, it is definitely... In, in a lot of ways up to the, the gods to determine this is like when you see the marathon runners where like their average marathon pace like you can't run once around the track at their pace <laughs> yes how often can you ride 35 miles per hour how long can you ride that on your tt bike like where it's flat like it's I don't, funny uh, money it's like a uh, different a minute i mean i don't know if i can even do it for a minute like i know right i don't think i could do it for a minute i've only done it downhill <laughs> Uh, when I, I sprint, like kind of sprint, I go up. 35. <laughs> like, yeah, right. When I sprint. <laughs> <laughs> and we're, we're, we're talking about a unique individual, too, because this is the guy who has broken the world hour record by a lot, beat Boardman's Superman time, and, and has also posted a new world record pursuit time. I mean, he's gone sub four in an individual pursuit. He's, he's, he's done things at both ends of the spectrum. Within I, two I weeks. Mean, Turn him loose on, on, on a sprint championship if, if the guy wanted to bulk up, and he could probably do that too. It's, it's ridiculous, his capabilities. And he's 6'4", which makes me like yeah. Yeah. almost, yeah. almost six tall four, as me. 80-ish kilos and ridiculous power. It's insane. I, it's 193 I, I, I haven't read what – hey, good job, Nate. Um, I haven't read what his <laughs> power is. Have you, Chad? I don't uh, – I, they had so so they they basically extrapolated, and I'm sure the power's out there, but I, I I hunted long and hard and I could not find it. But they were saying for him at a at a point one eight, I or a CDA versus a point two, oh he, he had to be somewhere between I think four sixty and four twenty, and I I think he must have been somewhere around four fifty, but but I don't know, and I wish I could find that. And if someone knows that, and and we're not live, but if someone can share that on the chat eventually, I'd I'd really be curious because I've hunted. And I can't find it. But it is interesting to note that he has area for improvement. I mean, I think he did nail his pacing strategy. He definitely negative split it, how well he did it. He went out a little hot. His lap times yeah, got said. where they needed to be. He kind of fell apart in the end. His CDA was somewhere between 0.2 and 1.8. I don't think – I don't know if they measured it. But if he's uh, more toward 0.2, then he can get down quite a lot. I mean, that, that small margin between 0.2 and 0.18 – is a pretty big one. Dan Bigham emphasizes that by being down way down at 0.15, which blows my mind and doing <laughs> He's a, a similarly He's fast time and a temporary <laughs> world record at much less power than Ghana. So I, I still think there's, it's not low hanging fruit by any means, but there's still fruit on the tree and he can pluck it and, and probably make that 57 and have that record untouched for a long time. Nice. Yeah. John, what was your CDA? That was incredibly low. Point two. Point one. I was point one nine eight. Is yeah. what he said when I when I wrapped my hands uh, very tightly. I am not in that position anymore. I've done a lot of work on my TT bike to change that around. Yeah, and that's with like you are much shorter than him, 
That is just oh, crazy yeah. that he's, he's six, four. six foot four. He's what? five inches taller than me. One ninety three centimeters. Like that is, it's just, it does not compute. Like I don't understand. Mm-hmm. And what's crazy is the like the four like if you said four forty FTP or four sixty, that's not crazy. Um, that's, that's not crazy realistic. high. Yeah, it's it's that's very realistic. And I think we've even seen uh, like NorCal racers who are that mm-hmm. height with that FTP, but not with that CDA. That's the mm-hmm. that's the mm-hmm. the magic between the two. Uh, yep, crazy. I know that he's done like over five hundred for shorter time trials uh, in road races, uh, whether it's been. You know, Grand Tour yeah, Grand Tourers or different Turin races. Adriatico Prologue, he was 520, 520 watts. And, and for like 20 minutes? Year, for the it? last, yeah, and for the last two and a half K, he was 670. I mean, it was, it's ridiculous. He's, <laughs> that's what I'm saying. We're working with a unique individual here. And they're steering him at the right things at the right time. Although I question that too, because, and that's another reason that makes me think he can do 57K plus, because he's coming directly off of... Tour de France, Mm -hmm. Worlds. He had a big season starting in February leading up to it. So he even remarked that he's carrying more fatigue into this than he would optimally like. What a beast. Okay, well, I'm going to retire from bike racing now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it, you got to go pedal my 200 watts yeah, and love me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right, moving on. People use published research to replace thinking. This is a good hot take. <laughs> I feel like I see this a lot with my I, role in Trainer Road, where with like the science of getting faster podcast, and um, I think people have access to research and will read excerpts from it and um, apply it without context. Um, research is tricky for us normies to have access to. <laughs> yeah, we don't. We abuse the power, <clears throat> yeah. like you know. Uh, yeah, I, I, you hear that a lot where people just cite a study and then they move on and they expect everybody to take that it like for fact and take it for granted when it's in most cases, the citing comes with a heavy layer of, of individual perspective that's applied to that, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's the whole abstract versus like reading the whole study where, um, the abstract says one thing, but if you read the study, the context of where this thing is applicable is extremely small and it doesn't, it's not what the people take the abstract and like extrapolate it to like everything rather than just what it says. And that's the common thing that people get messed up. And I don't think it's actually malicious. I think people read the the abstract and say, Hey, this says this, but the studies take, I mean, to really read a study it can take like two and a half, three hours. Right. Uh, yeah. to like really understand it. Cause those things are dense and go through the data and look at it and be like, okay, I understand what this is. And then to put into context who the age range was, what the group was, where they were in their fitness, all this sort of stuff. The methods of the study you have to like, and I've, what I've found is that if you're digging into a topic, you see one study done on something and then you read another and another and another. And suddenly you start to make a sense of the methods. You get more context around it. And then you start to recognize maybe weaknesses in a certain type of method yeah. and how a mm. conclusion that you have about this. Actually, you shouldn't form that conclusion in your head, Jonathan, because that method that they used might throw a wrench into those spokes. No, like that's, it's, that, it's tricky. that's actually a really good way to put it. You know how when uh, you get a new iPhone and you have to do the facial recognition thing and you have to take it and scan all aspects of your face and the circle starts to fill in, fill in, fill in. You've missed a spot, so you raise it up here and it fills that spot in and eventually you have a complete circle. That's kind of the journey of being able to look at research and translate it to to application, to, to recognize the gap in between the limitations, et cetera. And I think this, this statement, um, people use published research to replace thinking. I think there is a distinct defining line between reading the research and quote, getting it. And I think that's where the, 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 the wheat is separated from the chaff, the cream rises, et cetera. The people who can take the literature and, and make it useful and not just infer or, uh, make these, make these, big leaps, but say, I mean, that's just another little bit that completes that full circle, right? You, you, you now have this little extra bit of understanding. It doesn't get you all the way there, but now you have a better understanding in general and you can build upon that. But until you have that full circle, you're never, you're never going to know all of it, but you can at least get it. You, you can understand, okay, this is a small part of it. I'm going to factor that into the things I know and I'm going to move forward with this new little bit of understanding. And I'm going to continue that unending quest to further understand so much of uh, the difficulty of biological systems and performance and how those things relate. Um, mm-hmm. Two researchers aren't 
gods and they make mistakes. I remember yep. we were looking at one study for, I think I told this story before, I'll say it again, for the science of getting faster, where everybody, it was a blind time trial on compu trainers, and everyone negatively split the time trial. Like every single person. <laughs> I didn't realize. And I know, I was like, how can that happen, like ever, where that happens? And Chad, as you know, on a compu trainer, if you, like, as the wheel heats up, unless you do a spin down, you will, uh, the resistance gets easier. So you'll actually, it'll look like you're putting on more power. And, during this thing, they never calibrated. They didn't do like a warp of tower or do that. They just started. So that makes perfect sense why everyone would negatively split. And thus the measuring is wrong. And thus you kind of have to, you do have to invalidate the study. It's not, it's, it's not right with that. And, but that, 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 that study in particular is exactly what we're talking about here. And it, it kind of shaped my view and helped me, Nate, come along in this whole, whole, this, this pathway, this, this, uh, ascendancy to, to actually starting to understand this stuff. And, and you, caught something that should have been so glaringly obvious to me, considering this is what I did for better part of five years and reminded people every day, have you calibrated? And when we saw the unusual numbers, <laughs> did you calibrate? And nine times out of 10, nope. And the one time out of 10, it actually was a good day. But it did remind me that, man, you can just miss one thing and it doesn't invalidate this, the science, but it does call it into question. It does make you think, or make you recognize, I can't take this at, at first glance. There's more going on here. They missed something crucial. Mm-hmm. Good advice, yeah. guys. Mm-hmm. All right. Uh, this is going to be a great one. Structure training is overrated. Just ride lots. <laughs> Sometimes. Hard. This guy's I, trolling you, Ivy. <laughs> I want to, I would love to go toe-to-toe with this person. Uh, <laughs> in any race scenario. <laughs> this is Merck's era thinking. And it, it worked. It mm. works with her. It's not, I mean, I think everyone who's tried plug, Trina Road, you ride for a whole bunch of times. You do like a month of structured training and you're like, oh my gosh, this is insane. Why didn't I do this my whole life? I wasted so much time. It is, uh, we would not be a company if this, if you could just ride lots, sometimes hard. If that's all it was, we wouldn't be here. I mean, I'm going to start well, it implies that you have un- unlimited time, first off, which you don't. And again, it, it, it calls back to Merck's era training and racing. And they did what they did because that's what they had to work with. I mean, mm-hmm. you tell me, what, what could Eddie Merck's have done with Trainer Road? I mean, what could he have done with just structured training <laughs> in a more take. general sense? <laughs> <laughs> We're going to get flamed for that. Just say with like a power meter and yeah. uh, yeah. That's what I said. structured, that structured what training. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, With with anything, just just more information. I'm going to stir the pot a bit at here. Just ride lots, sometimes hard. That sounds super enticing. Like you tell me uh, that I'm going to get a lot for a little, I'm in, right? Like like the my brain's in. Okay, moving on. You don't need an off-season if you do zero intensity and only do long endurance rides. Chad, mm. I think you probably have a good input on this one. Uh, who, so the off-season achieves certain things that may best be accomplished if you just get away from the bike for a little while. Uh, an off-season and a, a hiatus, a brief you know, two-week hiatus, are not the same thing. So if we're talking a multi-month, you know, even a couple-month hiatus from training, a true off-season – I, I, I kind of agree with this as long as there's uh, – at some point you have to create a distinct desire to get back on the bike. And if you can do it by doing long endurance rides, that's all good and fine. Uh, in this, and it's hard to marry this all together. But if it's a true off season and it's for a couple months at time and you're at a time and you're not incorporating any intensity to that, be prepared to take the fitness hit that that's going to dole out. If we're talking a couple of weeks, you can get away with just about anything entirely off the bike, just long endurance rides. If you find that cathartic and refreshing, but that intensity comes into play. If you're going to extend that beyond a couple of weeks, because you're going to ta- start to take a serious hit that you may not be able to walk back when you start your next season's worth of training. What so about if you're a looking year, for <laughs> took, somebody took a year off? Oh, you're serious? Tra- training. <laughs> you, you got a lot of asking for a friend. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you, you remember that 170 watt FTP you had? Well, 189, <laughs> sir. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Don't you robbed me. Sorry. No, that's a full 10%. That's real. Yeah. Uh, yeah you're you're going to take a big hit. And so am I. I've been off the bike for a couple of weeks and, uh, or a couple of months. Sorry. But, uh, is what it is. I mean, I think those things come about organically. And, and, and if that's the case, then you kind of ride that wave and just, it, it spits you out on whatever beach you end up on. And then you, you get to decide <laughs> whether or not you want to do the work necessary to bring you back 
where you need to be. Do you understand that it's going to be a bit of a a bit of a swim? Okay. I, I show me the rider that does zero intensity. I don't know. Uh, maybe this question is hypothetical and that's the case, but I bet somebody's asking this and like, I never do intensity. And, and I see so many people say that. And then if you actually look at what they do, <laughs> they're chasing comms this. and yeah. Right. Ivy. I love it so much when athletes, uh, you know, write in questions about, uh, their workouts and workouts outside. And like Nate mentioned a while ago when we released workout levels V2, how people would be surprised, uh, when, what they actually think they're doing outside doesn't align with, um, or mm-hmm. what they think they're doing aligns with what they're actually doing. And mm. that's, that's so common that athletes think that they're only doing endurance and staying in zone two and they're absolutely not. <laughs> or they're just killing it. This was such a hard VO two backs ride, but no, you, mm-hmm. you just mm. did little hard efforts, but not like sustained VO two max that will mm, not even on offs, right? Let the, you gotta be ramped up for a while and you do that with on and offs or sustained work. Um, mm-hmm. and they just did little tedious works that efforts, maybe anaerobic bursts that felt like VO2 yeah. max, but we're not. Mm-hmm. I think the best recipe, or at least one of the best recipes in the event that you want to do two months, you just want to ride for the love of it is to keep it, but, but you still have your eyes on the, the bigger picture and you want to have good fitness when you come back and you want to be competitive that following season is to do truly easy rides and sprinkle them with, with truly hard efforts. And, and, yeah. and that, that sounds not super specific. I'm not talking percentages of FTP here, but I think everyone understands what easy actually feels like if they can make themselves do it and what hard actually feels like if again, they can make themselves do it. Hey, hot take workouts level V2 is going to be like when someone first gets a power meter and they thought they were riding smooth (laughs) and they see their power, like which it's, people are going to look at it and be like, "Mm -mm, I don't, this isn't true. I think I'm way better than this. And people Mm -hmm. go, I had a broken power meter. It jumps around all this time. I'm a very smooth rider. And it turns out you are not. And of course, isn't going to measure smoothness, but just the, the, the relationship between fitness improvement workouts or rides and, uh, how hard a ride feels. They're not Mm -hmm. apples to apples and you can get the same. It can feel just as hard and you can get a big fitness improvement for the future or you're going to ride this really hard and not really gain fitness. And this goes to that previous question about just ride hard sometimes, sometimes hard. Mm. We've all seen this. You just ride sometimes hard in a group ride. It's way different than if you're on that weekend, you do a two hour interval workout versus you do a, the shootout and, uh, yeah, you know, it's hard, but it's not the, it's not the same. Although uh, there are skills, there's, there's room. So I don't know before someone hates us. There's of course yeah. skills, things and stuff. <laughs> We've talked about this totally. many, many times. We, we covered it really well last week, right? Um, with uh, Ivy and Alex and Keegan and stuff. I, I, if I could take like a principle-based approach to this one, you don't need an off-season if you do zero intensity and only long endurance rides. Where's the training principle of novelty, of novel stimulus in place here? Like our body reacts to novel stimulus. And if you just do the same thing the whole time, having that time off is going to be beneficial. I'm almost certain just because it's going to, in this weird hypothetical situation that you only ride at zero intensity and only do low intensity, it's at least going to give your body a little bit of a break from it and then allow it to be able to take on something that will feel a bit fresh. You know, I know it's not totally novel, but I still, in this case, I'd still, yeah, take a break, just mix the things up a little bit. You know, there's no mm-hmm. reason to just do the same then- thing every day forever. I'm, I'm backing up a little bit, but what, what Nate just said when he looked at a, an unsmooth file or a raw data file, those are in my early days of data analysis with my athletes, that was super off-putting. Trying to f- determine any sort of signal in that sea of noise, trying to see what this athlete was doing without smoothing it and getting a, a, a broader picture of it. But it did, uh, even then, even in an unsmooth file that was just all over the place, just like a, a, an EKG of a person who's completely <laughs> fibrillating. <laughs> it, it, you could see where you were. Welcome to my steady. sustained power workout. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. You could see though where they were reasonably steady and where the surges came. There was a, a pretty distinct divergence between, yeah. you know, moderate and moderate to high but steady intensity, and then the real hard stuff. So even in those raw data files, you could see it. So if you can look at a raw data file and you can't differentiate between when you're going moderately hard or God forbid easy and hard, then you're doing it wrong Mm -hmm. good stuff guys all right hot take people overdo the warm-up for crits and are depleted and overheated at the start i think that's super true i see that a lot i'll I'll, I'll kick this one off 
It's uh, first off, I'm I'm not overly concerned with the depletion because crits at the high end are typically 90 minutes, and you can come into that loaded up enough to probably struggle through it, and then just a little bit of on board nutrition will get you through it in a in a well nourished state. The overheating, though, I think is the the big argument to make, and I think. Uh, over the years, I've heard of athletes who talk about warming up for a 60-minute crit for an hour or 90 minutes as though it's a badge of courage or something they should be uh, celebrated for. And it's just not. It's it's First off, that's way too much work to do prior to doing a whole lot of work. I, I feel like that should be so obvious. shouldn't have to state it. But the overheating is a real concern, especially when you're sitting on a trainer and you're not even riding around a course. So if you're revving up your – internal temperature, your core temperature before something that's going to really rev it up. Again, it seems so obvious. I shouldn't have to say it's not the right way to go. Yeah. And this approach would be different for crits, right, Chad, than something like a cross race or like short for track. Sure. Yeah. Across disciplines, it's all going to be, you know, shades of gray. So whether it's, I mean, there are, there are races you can roll into with zero warm up because it's a 200 mile race. And although there are those same races who are the top end of the thing, the top end of the competitors are going to hit it real hard from the start and you probably should be warm. So it's uh, uh, no overlap or overarching broad claims yeah. we can make. John, John, what's the shortest or least warm up you've ever had for a crit <laughs> and how did it work out zero can you on a number <laughs> you just roll up to the yeah roll up and like uh, i think even at a local crit i rolled up when they blew the whistle and i was just like getting clipped in in the parking lot and then i just kind of <laughs> caught onto the tail end of the group i, I make see it work. yeah yeah i see this with juniors doing way too much of a warm-up um, it's really common. So junior mountain biking, like in the Nike league and stuff, they're like, they do like a blowout effort. So like really like, like an all out spin on the rollers or something beforehand. And they do like mm -hmm. six of them or something. And it's like, you know, you don't need to do all that. <clears throat> I don't know. I have Chad has really shaped, uh, or he's been very kind in advising me in warm ups Cause I was like a, you know, a wild pinball just bouncing all over the place with like, <clears throat> I need to do a crazy specific warm up. I just need to go really hard. I need to accumulate a certain amount of KJs. Like there's a bunch of different theories on it. And, uh, I've settled on something pretty straightforward and simple. And I just make sure that I, that we have warm ups that you can see in trainer road, like the workouts, so you can filter them. And they're awesome. Kind of like rough templates for you to use. If you don't have a trainer, you can just kind of keep in mind that structure, just warm up over the course of 15 minutes. My power raises up to somewhere around sweet spot ish. And then I do maybe a little bit of riding at threshold, maybe one hard spin. If it's like a, if it's like short track or if it's a relay where I know that I need to be fast and Ivy's coming up next or something, but that's, <laughs> and, I, yeah. and I don't want to put anybody off cause this is just theoretical, but I, I question the, the merit of a clearing effort or one of those hard efforts, whether or not it actually lends to, and, and this be fun thing to look into. I don't know that there's a lot of research out there, but how, how absolutely essential that is. Because I think if you bring your aerobic system up to speed and then go race, you're going to have a, a, a pretty positive outcome 99 times out of 100. Whether or not that clearing effort is going to be the differentiator, uh, it's really got me guessing. I, I agree. Think, it's more like my yeah. head needs to get in the right spot, you know? Like, maybe. And, and, and maybe the psychological thing is the, the argument to be made. Yeah, this sometimes those don't work because I just as, they hurt a lot and then I don't feel better, like more ready. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. like, oh, you know God, I mean? that hurt a lot. And now I got to go do that 100 times. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I don't know if that is going to enhance a psychological state. I feel like what you need from your warm up too will change as you mature as a bike racer, mm. where a lot of that super intense warm up stuff needs needed for me to take place in order to yeah, mentally maybe. prepare for the effort that was going to happen. And if I didn't get that, I could never get in the mindset of going hard in the race. And as I matured sure. as a bike racer, I didn't need that. So you're so experienced and you know exactly what to expect and you can get in that mindset, you know, at yeah, that's, the drop that of a hat when ready. I think that makes sense. I think younger riders with all their nervous energy maybe benefit from running off some of it before the actual event yeah. begins. May not be performance beneficial, but it maybe put that maybe puts them in a better psychological state. Yeah. Why mm -hmm. right, you Nate Are you a big warm up guy? Nope. A little bit, but not good. Yeah. <laughs> Easy. Just get the blood pumping and go race. Uh, <laughs> all right. Uh I, I wanna do one 
honorable mention before we close off here, which was Keegan's uh, hot take submission. Sorry, I got it out him, but it was just e-bikes. Nothing That's else. Not in. e-bikes are good or e-bikes <laughs> are e-bikes. whack. <laughs> just Keegan, just e-bikes. <laughs> e-bikes are amazing. Yeah, we 100%. love e-bikes. Yeah. They're incredible. I, I love and they're getting that, better and better. Yeah. I love seeing people that wouldn't be excited about riding otherwise feel like they have a chance to with e-bikes or an equalizer, Mm -hmm. you know? They estimate that uh, because, so it's hard to separate e-bikes and COVID, but our local trail organization estimates that trail usage is up 80% uh, over the past two years versus what it was in the two years prior. And visibly, just from what I can see, the majority of that are e-bikes. And they also showed that it was like volunteer hours have tripled in volunteer awesome. like registration. Uh, I don't know. I think there was like a lot of fear about e-bikes coming into it for a lot of folks. And I don't know, maybe it's different in different areas, but boy, it sure is wonderful. I love it. Mm-hmm. And they're an awesome training tool that's underutilized. I wish I had one. It'd be a great training tool to use. So. Yeah. Bike companies, right. if you want to just give me an e-bike or something, you know, you know. <laughs> no, give me the e-bike so that I can Sorry. train with John. And <laughs> yeah. no, no, the, the, I agree. I think there's just pretty much everything about them is wonderful. And I do like the idea of uh, Gamera and I want to do bike tours. And if she were on an e-bike and I was on a regular bike, it's just a wonderful leveler. It makes the experience a shared one rather than she's with her group and I'm with my group. But I don't want one. I have no interest in it. I like, I like earning my downs. It doesn't mean all the benefits aren't there, all the upsides aren't there, the training effect, the, being able to just uh, actually session things in a fresh state. I think that's wonderful. Mm-hmm. But again, I like to earn my downs. I'm going to cut cool. this out. So when he asks to buy a uh, e-bike on train roads, <laughs> he'll be like, I didn't, I didn't ask. I, I said between the, one, between the 150 and the 160E, which do you think? And you said the 160E. I went with the 150 because that's I'm just saying ever. <laughs> oh, cool. So fried food. Nate's, Nate's pointing out a history of, of like things, you know, where when Chad I was can, like, Nate will I can never assure you if, a, yeah. if an e-bike winds up in my garage, it's because it's Amaretz. Nate Ooh. keeps receipts, man. It's doubling I can, down. <laughs> I can predict the future. If you like listen to this podcast, uh, <laughs> at least with Chad. Yeah. All right. But not with my race outcomes. (laughs) 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 Myself, I'm horrible. (laughs) No. Okay. Last one. Who is the fastest swimmer? Nate, John, Chad, or Keegan? And thank you for taking me out of this hot take. No, no, no. no. Just let me take this one. Okay. It's it's (laughs) Nate. It's Nate. We just have to eliminate him from the equation. We we make it John, Chad, and Keegan. Then it gets interesting. Otherwise, Nate's got too much history. He's hold on. He's a good swimmer. What, so if you're swimming like hundreds, doing four hundred, what's your pace? So I can hold ten one hundreds. No like idea. when I'm fast on one fifteen. Holy cow! That's yeah, like my. He's got when I was training for a triathlon. Like when I was, good. he's got youngster experience. I'm bad in the like open water. I swim in like zigzags and stuff. And if you look at my like Garmin stuff, it goes crazy. <laughs> but in the pool, uh, it's good. Dang. And especially right now, I've been lifting weights for a year. So I was like, Ooh, I wonder what it would be like if I got in the pool. And you and, yeah. in the open the water, pool. if you work on siding, then you're going to be just as fast in the open. I water. don't know. I know. And even at the end, there was some, there's like, um, this scissor technique I was doing with my legs where I would open them up when I would take a breath. But I just found at the end of my triathlon career and I, f- I got a little like um, donut thing to put around my legs. Trying to correct <laughs> that thing, I think it would go a lot, lot faster. Water wow. wings, a floaty. <laughs> 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 Give me a floaty, and I'm super fast. You're speaking yeah. my language now. Ivy. <laughs> That's what I'm all about. I, I I'm like uh, right now. If I was to go swim ten one hundreds, I bet I would do it at like one forty in a pool. Um, open water, probably around me uh, a little bit slower, maybe even with a wetsuit. So I'm, mm, I'm like, this me, I'm explains a little... your triathlon splits. I had a few races <laughs> on small races. I'm just saying, I, like, you know what you need to work on. <laughs> I could follow, I could follow somebody and I would come out with yeah. like the first group. But then if I get wow. by myself, it was really bad. If none of you ever really? did this where you follow somebody and they go off course and yes. you're just like, so off course, you're like, Oh gosh, I trusted Dude, you. You Nate, betrayed imagine- me. Imagine, Imagine sucking is like, like, oh, I don't want to say that. Imagine not being as fast as you and being back with like the crazy scrum because then everybody's going, uh, everybody's going in crazy directions. Yeah. You know what I mean? So yeah. it's like, it, it's not just the pack. It's everyone yeah. is going in crazy directions. It takes a lot of training to, so it's hard. You know what? I've gotten to a point with this. Sw- so I, and 
you know, I'm, I'm not publishing videos for everybody to judge. So I know this. So go ahead and judge me, uh, <laughs> you know, silently without visuals. But the one thing that I do have going for me is very, I feel like dialed in proprioception and, and being a technician. Like those are like my two like things that I try to apply to everything that I do. And that's how I can learn things quickly, usually. And I'm finally feeling like my technique. So I'm finally feeling like strength is a limiter. At first, when I started swimming, I was just like, well, drowning is my limiter. And I can't like, you know, that's the problem. And then at a certain point, I was like, well, no matter how hard I try, I just go slow. And now I'm to the point where if I try hard, I can drop my times down way slower than my or way lower than my uh, sustainable pace. And its strength is like the actual limiter. So I'm not saying I have technique down, but I'm saying like I'm to that point, at least in my progression, where it's like I need to build strength to be able to sustain the right technique and sustain that sort of pace. Like my stroke rate's so slow um, Mm -hmm. compared to what you'd see from like fast swimmers, that sort of stuff. And that's just been a product of me trying to figure out what the heck I'm doing in the water and taking my time with it. But now it's finally like, whoa, I don't have the strength to pull this off. So it's it's cool. It's It's really exciting. And there's like, depending on your school of thought, there are some people who are like super high stroke rate and some people are like lower. It's both are valid and you can be really fast either way, but it's probably both. Dude. Like you're going to get benefits from strength training and, you know, even the highest oh, yeah. level people still get technique. But I'm I, sure I hear what you're saying. find this where you like a, there's kind of, they level up at different rates where it's like suddenly like technique, <laughs> boom, it goes up. And then it's like, Ooh, now to sustain this technique, I need more strength or I need more something else. And then that levels up. And then you're like, Ooh, my techniques, I can improve. I need to focus on that. So that's just really exciting. Cause I haven't had that before. It's all been just like, you know, panicking in the water basically. But <laughs> yeah, that's where yeah. if you're, if you can't make it to the other side, you know, no matter how strong you are, it's yeah, not who cares? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> The one so what, I, between I you three, I've, it's going to be Chad. I think Ivy. I don't know. Can you swim no. very well? I mean, you can swim, but you got to do. <laughs> She's not even swim. In swim. No, I I wasn't part of it either, which I'm so glad that I was omitted <laughs> from this question. Uh, I would be like water wings, frog kicking, uh, not a swimmer. <laughs> Chad, you're a pretty good swimmer, though, aren't you? Mm-hmm. When I when I train it, I uh, improved quickly. I am a good student someone shows me something or explains something, I pick up on it pretty quickly. I think kind of what Jonathan uh, Mm -hmm. described, he's technically adept. He's got a high level of proprioception, so things register more quickly. I do think that can work against you, and I think what Jonathan described is it working against him. He's overthinking it. He's not feeling it. It's kind of like, Nate, when you get really analytical with mountain bike descending or something, you're not Mm -hmm. feeling it. You're thinking about it heavily, and it doesn't work in your favor. Um, But I think I struck a pretty good balance there. I I could turn it off and work on balance drills for long enough to make my brain relax for lack of a better description and then actually start to swim more smoothly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I, I progressed well when I, when I trained in the pool. And I'm just going to say we both destroy Keegan because he makes fun of me for being a bad swimmer <laughs> literally every day. So, uh, sends oh, me a meme about something drowning every single day and laughs. <laughs> so, <laughs> oh, but does he have this time's coming? Or try well, no, he, he was a swimmer when he was a kid. He did that. His oh, mom wow. was a D1 swimmer. She was like one of the best in the country uh, in college. So she was really good. Wow. Um, and so then he was he a trained, swimmer when he was a kid. Yeah, he would beat so, us up real good. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it, he wants to do an Ironman. That's like a big thing on his list. Like someday he wants to do it. He does like Ben Hoffman joins him for training rides and stuff mm. down in Tucson too. So he's like – you know, talking about it all the time with him. So we, we have this informal thing that we're both going to do an Ironman together for his first Ironman, uh, when his like bike career is done and I'm going to work so hard <laughs> to just <laughs> uh, like make maybe a sabbatical for a while, just so I can be crazy fast. Cause I want to beat him so badly at something. And I'm just hoping that he's a terrible <laughs> runner. And right now his run sucks compared to my run. And I bet if he trains for two weeks, it'll be way faster than I could ever be. Yeah, but mm-hmm. all right. But <laughs> anyways, yeah, yeah. Great. I'm well, faster thanks, than guys. Keegan. I'm going to say that right now. That feels good to say. I'm faster than Keegan. <clears throat> it's out okay. there. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, thanks, guys. This was great. Thanks everyone for joining us. Uh, if you like hot takes, let us know so we can do it again. Make sure you subscribe if you haven't. Give this video a thumbs up if you liked it. And make sure you go to Spotify and give us a rating because we're only just a few. We're tied. We're tied right now. We're just a few away from being the number one cycling podcast on Spotify. So make sure you go find Ask a Cycling Coach podcast. Give us five stars. We'd love it. 
Um, I'm going to share an interesting fact really quick. Did you know that roughly uh, that less than like uh, less than 2% of our listeners actually go and rate the podcast? Isn't that a shameful fact? Can't we all change that? <clears throat> 98% Great. of you. <laughs> Looking at you go rate the podcast. <laughs> All right. Thanks so much for joining us, guys. Make sure you submit your questions to turnerd.com slash podcast. We'll see you next time. Goodbye. Love you. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.